welcome to Barnabas to Eco Party. Bienvenido Barnabas a la Eco Party 2022. Thanks guys for having me. So, my name is Barnabas Pabayoannu. I'm a security researcher at Blue Frost Security. And today we are going to see some techniques that can be used uh, in the exploitation of pool overflows in the Windows segment heap. So the agenda for today, we are going to start with uh, some background information and then we are going to get into the actual exploitation techniques. Finally, we are going to conclude with some tools that can be used for debugging uh, the Windows segment heap uh, internals. Just a quick overview of the capabilities that are going to get provided by uh, the techniques we are going to discuss later on. So the minimum required overflow size is uh, going to be three bytes. As we can see, there are, there are no requirements on the actual overflow data. So the overflow data can be completely random and that will not affect the, uh, the success uh, uh, rate of the uh, of, of using the, the techniques. Uh, heap grooming is not easy, but as we can see later on, uh, it's not going to be difficult either. There is no dependence on the dynamic Luga site, and the techniques are applicable in uh, different implementations of the Windows segment heap. Moving forward, now we are going to have a high-level overview of. Uh, the flow and dynamic memory request flow, uh, dyna dynamic memory request is going to take. And that's going to be useful to, to see the different entities involved uh, when serving a dynamic memory request. And we're going to see where different metadata may, may come up and how we can uh, target those metadata. So we have a client that needs uh, some memory it puts forward a request. The request goes to the generic handler. The generic handler is, uh, is responsible for implementing uh, fu functionalities provided by the kernel uh, when it comes to dynamic memory, like, for example, quota management. And to implement those functionalities, it uh, requires some metadata, which can be either be embedded within the chunk itself, normally at the beginning of the chunk, or uh, that can be stored outside the chunk in a separate space. Uh, but the generic handler doesn't manage any memory. So to actually have uh, the chunk allocated, it will have to forward the request to one of the second level allocators. And as we can see, there are a couple of them. So uh, in order for the generic handler to pick to which uh, second level allocator is going to forward the request, uh, the primary criterion is the request size. So let's say that the LFH allocator is responsible for a specific request size range, uh, the VS allocator for a different range, and so on. So now uh, we are in the second level allocators, and here you can uh, think of each of these allocators uh, conceptually to be similar with, uh, let's say, malloc. So they, they get a big chunk in memory of memory and they manage that chunk and use it to serve uh, potentially smaller uh, size uh, uh, requests. So here we assume that the request goes to the VS allocator. So it the VS allocator takes us input uh, request size and finds a chunk that's suitable to serve uh, that request. So we see the VS allocator here found a chunk. It returned the chunk back to the generic handler. Uh, the generic handler added its own metadata to the chunk and returned uh, that chunk back to the client. It's noted that neither the client nor the generic handler are necessarily aware of the metadata used by the upper layer functions. So here we see the chunk returned to the client. And as you can see, it can have uh, at least two different kinds of metadata. It can have the generic handler metadata, and it can also have the VS allocator metadata. In this talk, we are going to focus on the, and we are going to target the VS allocator metadata, 
but it's noted that uh, previous work uh, in the Windows pool of airflow exploitation targeted uh, the generic hundred million data. And uh, if you haven't checked it already, have a look at the work done by Quarantine Budget and Paul Fariello. Hopefully I haven't butchered their names too much. Uh, but they, they did a great work uh, documenting the segment heap internals, uh, as well as uh, exploitation techniques uh, that target those, uh, as we said, the generic handless metadata. So now we are going to get into the VS allocator internals. And here we can see the sizes uh, which the, the generic handler uses to forward a request to the uh, VS allocator. And we can see that the VS allocator in kernel mode is responsible for a quite wide range of requests. And it's noted that uh, along with the LFH allocator are uh, the two most commonly used uh, uh, allocators uh, in the Windows segment heap. So now we're going to see the possible chunk states. Uh, so when a chunk, a, a chunk that belongs to the VS allocator can be uh, uh, in either of the two states, either freed or used. And depending on its state, it will have different metadata associated with it. So now let's see the used chunk states. And uh, we say that a chunk is used when it has been allocated to a client. And, it ha and the client haven't uh, deallocated that chunk. Those chunks are headed with uh, the header shown uh, in the slide here. And we can see also uh, its fields. And from those fields, uh, our primary field of interest is going to be the sizes field, since that field is going to be the target of the overflow, part of, part of that field. And uh, so here we can see the structure of uh, the sizes field. And among those uh, subfields of, of the sizes, we are going to target the memory cost and the unsafe size with uh, the overflow. It's noted that the sizes field is, uh, is encoded in memory. So regardless of the initial values of uh, the subfields uh, stored within uh, the sizes field, uh, all their values are going to be randomized at the end. So here we see the fields we are going to target with the overflow. And we have uh, the memory cost. The memory cost is uh, the number of pages occupied by a chunk, excluding uh, the page where its headers uh, lie into. And uh, this, header, th this field is not particularly important for the attack, but it just happens to be along the way of the overflow path. So we just see its use just to understand that we are not corrupting any important state of uh, the, the allocator. But this field is, is noted that it can, be, it can potentially be used for uh, the mitigations. And next, we have the unsafe size. And, and this is going to be the primary target of, uh, of the attacks we are going to describe later on. Uh, and this field holds essentially the size of the chunk divided by 16. And it's divided by 16 because uh, the VS allocator hands out chunks. And uh, it, it has an it has them al aligned to 16 bytes um, boundaries. Next, we have the free chunks uh, of the VS allocator. And here, a chunk that uh, we, we say that the chunk is freed when the client has called the deallocation APIs. And a chunk that has been freed, <coughs> it has been freed. It can be in either of uh, the three states we list here. It can be either part of the dynamic Luga site the delay free list or uh, be part of the free chunk tree. It's noted that, that for the purpose of this talk, we are going to focus on the free chunk tree, uh, since that's going to be the state of the chunks that we are going to attack. But uh, uh, if people want to get a closer look on, into the internals of the dynamic look at the, the delay free list, uh, you can have a look at the associated blog post, we are we go into more details uh, on how those uh, mechanisms uh, are implemented. So the free chunk tree, 
This is a primary structure used by the VS allocator to manage its chunks. It's a red black tree, and the chunks that belong to, the, um, to this red bl black tree are headed with uh, the structure shown here, the heap VS chunk free header. And we can see the fields of uh, this structure. And we can see the first field is uh, a field that overlaps with the used chunk. And essentially, this field is going, is going to be the sizes field we, we've seen previously uh, on the used chunk. After that, we have the node uh, uh, field, which uh, is used to maintain the red black tree. It, it's a classic node uh, uh, field with, uh, we can see the left, right, and parent uh, subfields. Now we are going to get into the allocation and the allocation processes uh, related with um, the free chunk tree. And we can start with the deallocation process. In the deallocation process, so when there is a request to deallocate a chunk, uh, we are going to first run the coalescing procedure. And here we are going to see the adjacent chunks of uh, the requested uh, chunk for deallocation. We are going to see if its adjacent chunks are already freed. And if they are already freed, they are going to get merged with the, uh, with the actual target of the, the deallocation. And the potentially merged chunk is going to get added to the free chunk tree, which is the red black tree structure we previously uh, discussed. And we can see a diagram here that shows uh, how, the, how this coalescing might work in practice. This is a location process, and uh, it's easier to just see the diagram. So we have a request for a particular size. That request goes to the VS allocator. The VS allocator adjusts that request size to account for its own metadata. So here we can see that it added 16 bytes, and uh, the new adjusted size is uh, 400 in hex bytes. After having the adjusted size, uh, the VS allocator uh, iterates the free chunk tree using a best fit strategy and tries to find the chunk that uh, is the most suitable to serve that particular request. In this uh, example, you can see that uh, the 900 chunk was the one that uh, uh, was picked and was selected to serve that request. And, uh, Next, the allocator is going to check if uh, this identified chunk is bigger than the chunk that was actually, than the size that was actually requested. And if it's bigger than the actual uh, request size, it's gonna go through the splitting phase. And in the splitting phase, we are essentially gonna break apart uh, the identified chunk in two. The first part is going to uh, get used to serve uh, the actual request. And the second part, what we call here the reminder chunk, is going to get added back to the free chunk tree. To, and it's going to get used, potentially used, in uh, future requests. So just to drive it home, uh, we have the, the same scenario as before, but we have now changed a little bit the, the state of the red black tree. We change some nodes from the tree. So we ha again, we have a request of 3F0 size. We adjusted that size. We have 400 uh, size adjusted size. And we, now we want to see which chunk is going to get used to serve that request. So we're going to give it a couple of seconds. Which chunk do you think is going to get used to serve that request? So. Anybody picked chunk with size 0x200? Raise your hands. So fortunately, there are no hands raised. Otherwise, we may have to prematurely end the presentation. But if you picked the chunk with size uh, 400, then <coughs> that's going to be wrong as well. But that was a reasonable uh, choice. And the correct, the, the chunk that's going to get picked is going to be the chunk with size 500. 
and we can see that this, th then it's going to go through the splitting phase. The first 400 bytes are going to get returned to the, to the client, and the other part is going to get added back to the free chunk tree. But why did we pick the 500 chunk? Since we had in the tree uh, the 400 chunk, which was the exact uh, request size, and the reason for that is uh, two optimizations found in the kernel mode implementation of the, of the segment heap, which are enabled with the page align uh, large allox flag. And those two optimizations are first, uh, the allocator is designed to efficiently uh, allocate chunks that are bigger than a page and have those chunks be page aligned. And second, it's designed to maximize the memory that can uh, be decommitted. Uh, for the chunks that are part of the free chunk tree. Going to more details into how the first optimization is implemented, and we can see that uh, in order to have those chunks be page aligned, uh, the allocator follows a simple rule, and that rule is that only chunks that, are, um, that start at page offset F is zero can be, uh, can be crossing the boundaries of a page. All the other chunks, have to be confined within a single page. And this design decision uh, affects uh, both the allocation and the deallocation processes. In the deallocation process, if you recall, we, we mentioned the coalescing procedure where we might, we might end up with a merged chunk. That chunk is gonna get uh, checked to see if it's indeed following the rule we mentioned before. So that chunk is gonna get checked to see if uh, it starts if it's, cro if it's crossing the page boundaries, and if it does, and it doesn't start at page offset F is zero, it's gonna get split. And we can see this process in the diagram below, where a chunk is crossing the page boundaries but doesn't start at the page offset F is zero, and the first part of that chunk uh, is split, and we can see that it's confined within a single page, and the second part is crossing the page boundaries, and it starts at page offset F is zero. And we have the same, uh, something similar happen uh, in uh, the allocation process. In, now in the splitting procedure, where we, we might end up with the, as we said before, we might end up with a, a reminder chunk. That reminder chunk is gonna get checked again and see if it follows uh, the rule we have mentioned uh, before. But why do we say that, the, why did they pick the offset F is zero? Since we know that uh, the used chunk header is 16 bytes, if we start the chunk at page offset F is zero, then uh, the user data of the chunk are going to be placed at page offset F of zero. So that kind of beats the, the purpose of uh, implementing this optimization, which was supposed to have the chunk be page aligned. Uh, and the reason why they picked the page offset uh, F is zero is uh, related with the second optimization, where we said that it's designed to maximize the memory that can be decommitted. And they do this, this optimization is implemented by adding an extra 16 bytes to the chunks, uh, as padding to the chunks that start at page offset F is zero. So now, at page offset F is zero, we are going to have the used, used, header, uh, used chunk headers. And at page offset FF zero, we are gonna have the padding. So the, user, uh, so the user data portion of the chunk now is going to be page aligned. But why is this uh, useful in uh, maximizing the memory we can decommit? So on the left diagram, we see uh, a chunk so we see the scenario in case we didn't have this uh, extra padding. So if we started the chunk at page offset FF0, then after the chunk got freed, it's free chunk headers, which is 32 bytes, will have crossed uh, the page boundaries. And it's also noted that when uh, a page contains chunk headers, then it cannot be decommitted. So here, because we have uh, headers in both pages, both the previous and the, both the previous page of X and uh, at page X, then none of those pages can be decommitted. But now with the, the extra padding, which we can see 
On the right uh, diagram, uh, we can see that the whole free chunk header can fit uh, within a single page. So now we can free the page uh, right after that. And this is implemented, this extra padding is implemented by now adding a, an extra step during the process where we adjust the request size before iterating the free chunk tree. And we can see that now we, are, we add an extra 16 bytes. So now the size that uh, the adjusted request size is going to be 410. And now makes more sense why we picked uh, the 500 chunk. Uh, so now, now that we have a chunk uh, uh, identified, the 500 chunk, the, the allocator is gonna check if it starts a page offset F is zero. And in this case, we assume that it does the start at that offset. So the return chunk size is going to be, uh, is going to be 400 bytes. Uh, and it's gonna get split again and the reminder of the chunk is gonna get added back to the free chunk tree. But it's noted that if the chunk, if the 500 chunk was starting at page offset F is zero, then the return chunk size will have been 410. So that's uh, the background information that we're gonna use. Here we see a summary with uh, the different sizes, uh, the, the different chunk sizes and how those sizes uh, map to different characteristics uh, found in both the generic handler and the VS allocator. This slide is useful for reference. Uh, it's not particularly important to uh, discuss any further for now. Now we're gonna get into the exploitation techniques. We're, we're gonna start with the terminology. So we have the vulnerable chunk, what we call the vulnerable chunk, and this chunk is uh, a chunk of dynamic memory allocated to a program which has a vulnerability and we can trigger that vulnerability to have this buffer overflowed. And we can see a, a very simplistic uh, code pattern where we have an allocation of a, of a buffer with size 200 and we attempt to write to that buffer, to, to that buffer data with size uh, 303. And it's noted that the numbers I've used there, cool, it's very, likely, it's very li likely to be exploitable with the techniques we are gonna discuss now. Next, we have the Bruce Banner chunk. A and before explain ex explaining the Bruce Banner chunk, it's noted that some references in the terminology are gonna use uh, some references for, from the Hulk movie. Supposedly it's gonna make uh, explanation easier, but yeah. So now we have the Bruce Banner uh, chunk and this chunk is uh, a chunk that is close uh, in the vicinity of the vulnerable chunk. Here we see it's adjacent to that chunk and it's the chunk we are gonna target with the overflow. And more precisely, we are gonna target uh, the VS header uh, of that chunk. In the middle diagram now, we have, uh, it's the state we are after the overflow. And we can see that uh, after overflowing the VS header of the BB chunk and mutating its uh, size, we turn, it, we turn it into a mutant chunk. Uh, and this chunk is, uh, the goal is to have this chunk be bigger than the actual size of the BB chunk of the Bruce Banner chunk, which we are gonna call BB chunk from now on. Uh, yeah, so now we have the muta chunk uh, in the free chunk tree, and we, we can issue now a request to the allocator and have the allocator pick that chunk uh, from, that, from the free chunk tree and have it all allocate the overlapping chunk. And the goal of the overlapping chunk is to capture that uh, size we managed to extend the muta chunk with. And uh, with that extra, uh, with that additional, let's say, size that uh, the overlapping chunk is gonna have compared with the actual uh, size of uh, the bimbi chunk, then we are gonna be able to overwrite part of the overwritten chunk. And the overwritten chunk is gonna be uh, the target of the attack. It's gonna be 
the chunk we are going to use to override its headers and try to build our primitive for a simple pullover flow to something stronger. So now we are going to see some generic concepts uh, that we are going to use. To, uh, we are, are going to use for the attack and uh, some reliability tools that are going to be useful to successfully execute uh, the techniques. And we are going to start with the fence chunks. And the fence chunks are chunks we are going to inject into the free chunk tree in order to maximize the probability that we are going to be the first to uh, have access to the mutant chunk in order to allocate the overlapping chunk. So we don't want some random request after placing the mutant chunk into the free, into the free chunk tree. We don't want some random request uh, using the mutant chunk uh, to serve their own uh, 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 chunks. So let's see, let's see the, the diagram here. So on the leftmost diagram, we see we have a random request of 4,000 bytes and the allocator is going to use the mutant chunk because it's the, most, it's the most suitable chunk to serve that request. In the middle diagram, we, we see the state of the free chunk tree after injecting the fence chunk. And here again, if we receive the same request of 4,000 bytes, then uh, the allocator is going to pick the fence chunk and not the mutant chunk. So we managed to to keep the, let's say in a sense, the, the mutant chunk safe. And in the rightmost diagram, we see we, are, we see that by requesting a size, a chunk with size uh, 7,000 bytes, we can actually make the allocator uh, give us the, the mutant chunk. And in order to, for, for this, uh, let's say, tool to, success, to, to increase, let's say, the success rate of this uh, technique, we have to pick the appropriate fence chunk size. So in a sense, we have to kind of know which is the maximum uh, expected request size for a particular time period. So now, let's say, if we know that size is 4,000 4, bytes, we need to pick a fence chunk that's slightly bigger than that or at least bigger than that. And here we see that we have picked a fence chunk of size 6K in bytes, and that should allow us to have access to the mutant chunk on demand by, recommend, by requesting a chunk size uh, with size bigger than the, the, um, the fence chunk. And how can we find the appropriate fence, ch fence chunks? We can see here a simple uh, dtrace script, which can be used to, let's say, sample the sizes that go to the VS allocator. And from there, we can find the appropriate sizes. Next, we have the trap chunks. And the trap chunks are uh, relayed mostly to the, to, the to the phase after the allocation of the overlapping chunk. So after injecting the fence chunk and after uh, allocating the overlapping chunk, uh, and in this phase, and after, over, after allocating the overlapping chunk, the allocator is going to split. As if you recall, during the allocation process, uh, the allocator is going to split the identified chunk. So the allocator is going to get the mutant chunk, is going to use it to serve the overlapping chunk, and it's going to split the part if it's bigger than the size of the uh, of the, of, if, if it's bigger th than the overlapping chunk, and insert that reminder chunk to the free chunk tree. So we want, using th those trap chunks, to minimize the probability that the reminder mutant chunk is going to uh, get used to serve some request. Because if it, gets, if it gets used to serve a request, then it means that it might, uh, we might corrupt uh, some memory that doesn't belong to us. Uh, and how we pick sizes for trap chunks, it's simpler than the fence chunks. We just in inject the allocator with different sizes, and this should uh, have this approach work. And uh, now we're going to see it's important to, to describe the states, the, uh, 
the Bruce Banner chunks are going to have before the overflow. And before the overflow, the Bruce Banner chunks can be in two different states. They can be either freed, they can be either be used or freed, and freed within the, the free chunk tree. And in this talk, we are going to focus on the, we are going to describe, uh, the, the, our examples are going to be based on the uh, allocated, when the Bruce Banner chart is going to be allocated. Uh, but the other two attacks are also viable options. So in the allocated uh, chunk attack, uh, where, it's, uh, where we, is, we assume that the BIMB chunk is going to be allocated, so we trigger the overflow, and then we, we deallocate the BIMB chunk. So after deallocating the BB chunk, the overflowed uh, BB chunk size is going to get used to be added to the free chunk tree. And this should cause the transformation of the BB chunk to uh, what we call here mutant chunk. And then we can use uh, appropriate request size to allocate the overlapping chunk. And that should conclude. Uh, it's fairly simple, this uh, methodology. The other two attacks assume that the, the BB chunk are, is, is already freed, and we are essentially corrupting uh, the Red Black Tree nodes uh, directly. But we are not going to focus on those uh, attacks here. But it's noted that if, uh, in the blog post, in the associated blog post, which is going to provide at the end of the presentation, we go into more uh, details in all three of those attacks. So now just a quick uh, summary. Our goal is to override uh, the size field of the BIMB chunk and make it look like it's bigger than it actually is and allocate based on that chunk, the, uh, on that, let's say, corrupted chunk, bigger chunk, allocate the overlapping chunk and have the overwritten chunk uh, uh, manipulated with our own data. But the challenge here is that uh, the size field is uh, randomized because of the encoding we discussed uh, at the beginning. So what that means is that regardless of the actual size of a chunk, its encoded uh, value is going to be completely ra random. And the same stands true for uh, if, we, if we take the other way around. So if we overwrite with a specific, let's say, size, the encoded size, then the coded size is again going to be random, a random value. And it's uh, two aspects of the two sides of the same coin. And what that means for, 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 for our uh, scenario is that after corrupting the size of the BB chunk, we won't be able to know uh, the size of the mutant chunk. And that's problematic because if uh, there is a big chunk in memory, corrupted big chunk in memory, the allocator might use that chunk to serve uh, random requests, and we might corrupt memory belonging to other processes. And that's, uh, that's not, uh, we are going to uh, uh, corrupt the system. So now let's see some uh, how we can approach this problem. And we are going to start with the LSB technique, what we call the LSB technique. And here we are going to override the least significant byte of uh, the BB chunk and manipulate the heap in such a way so as uh, uh, after the overflow and after creating, creating the mutant chunk, the mutant chunk is going to be limited within a control area. So even though we are not going to be able to know its actual size, we are going to know that uh, it's going to fall within an area that's under our control. And how we can achieve that? Uh, a key element to, to run this technique is to pick the appropriate BIMB chunk size. And two requirements we have for the BIMB chunk is First, it has to be bigger than a page. And second, it has to, its end has to be as close as possible to the beginning of its final page, which we can see in the green circle. And here in this uh, case, it's at page offset uh, 0x20 from the beginning of its uh, last page. And uh, why are those requirements important? We have to keep in mind two, two things. First, uh, 
chunks that are bigger than a page, which is our first requirement, those chunks start at page offset f is zero. Remember the page alignment optimization. And second, after the overflow, the least significant byte of the, uh, of the BB chunk is going to become randomized. And uh, re the resulting Newton chunk can have the sizes shown in the blue circle. And what, what if, you, if we combine those two together, uh, we can see that the, the Newton chunk, even though we, we won't know its size, it's going to fall somewhere between uh, the page boundary X and page boundary X plus one, which is controlled by us. So in the middle diagram, we see the state we have after the overflow. So we have converted the BB chunk to a Newton chunk. And we can see that uh, the least significant byte uh, randomized into uh, the value 5D. Uh, it's noted that the original value was, uh, of the BB chunk was 4. And what that means is that we have managed to successfully extend the, B the, the Newton chunk beyond uh, the limits of the uh, original BB chunk size. And by the way, the numbers we have used here are actual numbers uh, from a system. It wasn't like, it was, uh, it's, it's not like uh, my, my own numbers uh, uh, used just to illustrate this example. And at the final uh, diagram, we see uh, the allocation of the overlapping chunk. So as we said before, the Newton chunk is gonna be now in the, in the free chunk tree, and we just request a size big enough to have the overlapping chunk allocated and uh, override part of the overwritten chunk. So that's the high level, level that's the high level uh, overview of the attack. And uh, okay, and in theory it looks like it should work fine, but does it require uh, stars to be aligned or page aligned? And it's not exactly like that, like that. And we'll see here, for example, a simple approach that can be used for creating those, uh, all those, satisfying all those requirements, at least for the kernel mode implementation uh, of the segment HIMP. So we start with uh, the BB chunk allocation. And it's noted that even though we use specific numbers uh, in this uh, methodolog methodology here, the, the, the approach we use here can be generalized to create uh, and, uh, and use it for different sizes. So as we said, we start with the allocation of the BB chunk, uh, of the BB chunks, and we create a bunch of, let's say, CO40 chunks, which was the size used in the previous example. And it's noted that uh, when the free chunk tree is iterated to find a suitable chunk for a particular request, if it can't find a chunk within the free chunk tree that's uh, big enough to satisfy the request, then it's gonna allocate uh, a big uh, chunk of memory and it's gonna use that chunk to uh, serve the request. And uh, the reminder of that chunk is gonna get added back to the free chunk tree. So if we keep that, this in mind and, and uh, keep, that, keep in mind that we have the page align optimization in place and that the commit optimization then that's going to result into some good news for us. And uh, th those good news is that we get uh, left with the diagram shown here at, uh, on the top. And we can see that we have the BB chunk allocated to us, which was the request uh, size. And the adjacent chunks of the BB chunk are going to be freed and be added to the free chunk tree. And if we compare the top diagram with the bottom diagram, we can see that we are very close to the diagram required to run uh, the LSB attack. And so what's left now is to allocate uh, and capture those uh, adjacent free chunks and we can complete the attack. Uh, so now let's see how we can recover the overwritten chunk and we can see that it's, the free chunk size is uh, with size FC0 
So to capture that chunk, we have to take into account uh, the VS uh, allocator headers, the generic handler headers, and the padding. And if we request a chunk with size F90, we should be able to capture this chunk. Next, we have the vulnerable chunk uh, uh, recovery. And here, it, it's a bit more challenging because uh, the vulnerable chunk size, with, which is the, the adjacent chunk of the MBB chunk, is going to have a specific size, and it's more, it's, it's more likely to, it's very likely to be smaller than the size we have uh, through our heap uh, manipulation, which is FB0 in this uh, case. So, how can we create an adjacent chunk to the MBIMB chunk that's going to be the target's uh, vulnerable chunk size? To do that, uh, we can see that the, the title of this step hints to the solution, and we are, we are going to carve the vulnerable chunk of that potentially bigger uh, uh, super chunk adjacent to the uh, BIMB chunk. So how we can uh, do this carving? So we have to remember that uh, the VS allocator iterates the free chunk tree using a best fit strategy, and it, it also runs the uh, splitting process where it, uh, the reminder chunk of the identified chunk is added back to the free chunk tree. So if we keep those two in mind, uh, we can create what we call here uh, different splitting rounds, and the goal in each splitting round is to create a specific request size that's going to result in a particular reminder chunk size. And at the end of our splitting rounds, our goal is to get as close as possible uh, to the target vulnerable chunk size. And by the end of the final round, we should have the target vulnerable chunk size. And here we picked uh, van, van, as, as vulnerable chunk size uh, 390, but it's noted that this approach can be used uh, to carve uh, most, uh, a lot of different uh, uh, vulnerable chunk sizes. So after this step, we are left with a bunch of uh, chunks with size 390 to the free chunk tree. And we can, uh, just to clean up some noise, create some uh, 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 temporary request with size of 390, and then we can trigger the allocation of the vulnerable chunk. After triggering the allocation of the vulnerable chunk, we go to step five, which is the injection of the free chunk tree with fence chunks. And then we can trigger the overflow uh, and, and free the Bimbi chunk. So at this point, we should, get, uh, we should have the mutant chunk into the free chunk tree. And now to actually allocate the overlapping chunk, we can request uh, uh, a chunk size slightly bigger than the fence chunk, and we should be able to capture the over, over, overlapping chunk. And this concludes this technique. Uh, next, we have the MSB technique, which is, uh, in a sense, the brother of the LSB technique. And uh, as we said before, the LSB technique, the LSB technique targets the least significant byte of uh, the BB chunk, and the goal is to cage the mutant chunk and have it in a fall into a control area. Here, we are, we are going to take uh, the opposite direction. We are going to overflow both bytes of the BB chunk, and we are going to manipulate the heap layout and the heap state in order to make uh, that chunk inaccessible, or at least to minimize the probability that that chunk is going to be used for random request, and at the same time, maximize the probability that it's going to get used by us uh, in order to be able to allocate uh, the overlapping chunk. So in a sense, we are going to release uh, the mutant chunk into a remote area, and we are going to make it difficult for people to come in contact uh, with our mutant chunk. And we can see Hulk here in an island, uh, which supposedly may make it more difficult for people to come in contact with him. And the challenge here, as we said, we are going to end up with a huge mutant chunk. Uh, and given our goals, which are to maximize the probability that we are going to be the first to 
to use that new new chunk from the free chunk tree and minimize the probability that the reminder new chunk uh, is going to remain unused and get buried in the free chunk tree. Uh, if we recall uh, from our reliability tools, we can use uh, the fence chunks and the trap chunks, and we should be able to make this approach work in practice. And um, after finishing the attack, it's important to uh, clean up the heap since uh, our uh, reliability tools have some sort of expiration uh, time. Given enough requests, they are eventually going to fail. And here we see a quick diagram of uh, the MSB approach. And the middle diagram, we see that we end up with a huge mutant chunk that could potentially cross uh, the memory that belongs to different processes. And if th that memory gets used to allocate some uh, chunks, it's going to corrupt that memory that doesn't belong to us. So that's it. Uh, now we are going to see some tools. So along with this talk, uh, we have released a WinDebugger JavaScript extension that aims to export different uh, internal structures used by the VS, the, the, the segment heap allocators. For example, we can see that we can export all the chunks that are part of the free chunk tree, which fall within a specific size range. Uh, finally, the pull command is not behaving very uh, nicely within the kernel mode uh, segment heap. So for a, a good alternative, check out the extension created by Yarten Shafir uh, called pull view. Here are some references made throughout the presentation, and we can see the blog post and uh, also the, uh, the WinDB debugger extension. And that's all. Thanks for listening. And we can take any questions uh, if there are any. Gracias, Barnabas, Gracias, Barnabas por tu presentación. Thank you for your presentation.